Robert H. Tinker, PhD, has been licensed as a psychologist in private practice for the last 35 years, specializing in EMDR, eye movement, desensitization, and reprocessing treatment for adults and children, family and marriage therapy, phantom limb and pain memories, and motor vehicle accident treatment. He is a senior author with his late wife, Sandra A. Tinker Wilson, PhD of Throw the eyes, through the eyes of a child, EM, EMDR with children. Dr. Tinker and, Ms. And, and Wilson were co-trainers for EMDR, child trainers in Europe, and taught EMDR to therapists around the world to work with children. Between the years 1995 and 2009, trainings were conducted in countries included, including Canada, China, England, France, Germany, Italy, Japan, Mexico, the Netherlands, Norway, Rwanda, Scotland, Switzerland, and the United States. Dr. Tinker is a renowned and frequent keynote speaker and media spokesman as an EMDR ambassador, Dr. Bob Tinker. Thanks very much. I want to salute all of you who are still here. And you know, I can kind of see your, your prefrontal cortices smoking, <laughs> and smoldering from all the information you've been given. And I wanted to say how much I appreciate being here and being asked to be here. I have the best job in the world. I get to see severely traumatized individuals get better really quickly through EMDR. Um, my talk this afternoon is, like the others, 20 minutes, and I realized as I put this talk together that if I explained the slides uh, that I would be showing, uh, would never get through this. So I'm going to pretty much ask you to just give me your attention, and I will point out a few things on a few slides but mostly I'm going to talk about EMDR. I also noticed where I appeared on the program, being the second last speaker, and I was thinking, what am I going to do? How am I going to start this out? So I decided to start out with a story. And this story has a metaphoric relationship with EMDR, and I'm not going to tell you what that metaphoric relationship is. I'll let you decide what it is as we go through this. But the story goes, this guy is walking through rural Ireland, and he passes the cottage that has a sign on it that says, Talking Dog for Sale. So he thinks that's kind of interesting. He knocks on the door and says, excuse me, do you really have a talking dog for sale? And the owner says, yeah, he's, he's in the backyard. You can have a look if you want. And so he goes to the backyard, and there's a dog, and he says, excuse me, are you the talking dog? And the dog says, yeah, that's me. And he says, well, this is really pretty amazing. How did you ever become a talking dog? And the dog says, well, when I was just a puppy, I realized that I had the capacity to understand the spoken word. So I worked really assiduously to acquire the ability to speak it. And one thing led to another, and pretty soon I was working for a local constable. And we made a few drug busts and caught a few terrorists. And word spread. I started working for Interpol. You know, bigger drug busts, more arrests of terrorists. And then. I got sent to the United States. I worked for the CIA and the DIA and Department of Homeland Security. And now I'm back at home. A dog's life is short, you know. And it's been a good, good life. And I'm in retirement now. And so the man rushes up to the owner and says, that dog is amazing. How much do you want for that talking dog? And the owner says, I don't know. Says. 10 pounds? 
And he says, 10 pounds? That dog is worth thousands. Why so cheap? And the owner says, well, it's all bullshit. He never did any of that stuff. <laughs> OK, now that I have your attention, <laughs> um, I would like to say that I have a white paper that will be available online. It's about 50 pages and goes into much more detail about the research that we've done that I really am not able to go into here. And um, also the slides will be available. And so I'm just going to talk without going into details about those things so we can get through what I think is really important. Um, for those who don't know too much about EMDR, and I think there are a lot of people that fit into that, um, EMDR is a form of therapy that is extremely powerful with persons who've been psychologically traumatized. It also is useful in cases where people are emotionally stuck, whether they're stuck in anxiety or depression or anger or rage or fearfulness. EMDR can be useful even though no trauma has been found. It helps people get unstuck. And it's been around for about 25 years. The first research appeared in 1989. And in that study, they took a group of Vietnam veterans who back then, 20 to 30 years after Vietnam, still had PTSD symptoms, nightmares, flashbacks, intrusive thoughts. And these guys had been in every form of therapy known. They'd been in every different kind of medication possible. But they still had their symptoms. And they put them through one session of EMDR, and they lost their PTSD symptoms. So it was a really striking kind of finding. And then my associates and myself expanded on that original research, only now with a much larger sample and much more strict scientific controls. And so in a 1995 study, we got 80 adult individuals who were severely traumatized. And we provided them with, first of all, an intense battery of psychological instruments and found that they were enormously high in anxiety and depression and PTSD symptoms. And then we provided them with three sessions of the EMDR. And when we remeasured them after those three sessions, we've now found that they fell in normal limits on anxiety, depression, and PTSD symptoms. And we followed up three months later, found the results held, and got that published in the most scientifically rigorous journal in clinical psychology. And then 15 months later, we went back to see how these individuals were doing 15 months after just those three sessions. And at that point, found that 84% were functioning normally as they had before their traumas. And the other 16% showed some, some improvement, but almost definitely needed more than the three studies, three sessions we provided in that study. And we got that published in the same journal. And since then, we've continued doing research with children, with children of war, with children on a group basis, with police officers, and in this arcane area of phantom limb pain. I also did a case series with 108 consecutive motor vehicle accident victims, all of whom had PTSD, most of whom had injuries, and in that case series of 108, it took an average of five sessions from then to for them to be able to drive comfortably again and lose their nightmares and flashbacks and intrusive thoughts. Now, if anything indicates neuroplasticity, it's this kind of model where you have normal brain functioning, you have a trauma, 
And following the trauma, the entire nervous system is dysregulated. And then you have a method of treatment that helps to re-regulate the nervous system. Now this particular slide, the, the SUD scale, SUDS is a unit of, or a scale from zero to 10 that indicates the amount of psychological distress a person has. And so with these 80 individuals, you can see that they started out at a very high level of distress. And after the first session, okay, high level of distress between eight and nine, we have immediate treatment and we have delayed treatment. And initially, they're between eight and nine. And after the first session, at the end of the first session, they're down between three and four. We have the second session go down, goes down further at the end of the third session, uh, really quite low. Um, VOC is a measure of uh, really self-efficacy more than anything else. And so initially these people asked what they'd like to believe about themselves in relation to the trauma and they said things like, I'd like to think that I was competent, I did the best I could, uh, I learned from it, it wasn't my fault. And initially, on this measure, the, it didn't seem very true, but increased in, in how much they could believe that was true on a scale from one to seven. So that was one of the process measures, actually two of the process measures, and um, I'm gonna skip over these. On, on one of those tests, this is fairly typical. Um, one of the major classes, I'm sorry. Um, one of the major Symptom groups in PTSD are symptoms of intrusion, such things as nightmares and flashbacks and intrusive thoughts. And these individuals in both the treatment and delayed treatment groups started um, a standard deviation above the mean, and by the end of treatment and three-month follow-up, they were pretty much at the mean in terms of intrusive symptoms. And with Avoidance, another major symptom group, we found the same thing. It went down, stayed down for both groups. Um, a measure of anxiety, they started out really between two and three standard deviations of the mean and then within the mean, within a standard deviation of the mean um, at the end of the three month follow up. Same effect with depression. They started quite high on depression, three, three standard deviations of a, above the mean between two and three, and within a standard deviation of the mean after their three sessions. Uh, we did a 15-month follow-up study, which I mentioned that 84% were functioning normally. Uh, we then divided the groups into those who had complete PTSD and those who had partial PTSD, meaning those who had uh, PTSD symptoms but didn't meet the full diagnosis. Those persons having full PTSD got as much benefit as in change as those who had partial PTSD. And again, we see how they did on intrusion and avoidance symptoms. And, and now I'll move into phantom limb pain. It may not be intuitively obvious, but phantom limb pain has a lot in common with PTSD. For example, 20 years after amputation, 70% of amputees still have phantom limb pain less than 8% show any kind of permanent benefit from any treatment that's available. 
in our work with phantom limb pain, with leg amputees, we got elimination of phantom limb pain with, with 80% uh, in our case series. And this illustrates our first two clients with phantom limb pain, that their pain level started at about six on a zero to 10 pain scale. And after three sessions, our first client went down to zero pain. Our second client went down to pain level of two. The reason that she stayed at two was that she had to have stump revision surgery, uh, which is where they cut off another inch or two of the stump you know, so that they can repad the end of the stump because the bone had started coming through the end of the stump. So it was reparative revision surgery, and she was facing that and was afraid that she would develop phantom limb pain again and couldn't quite believe she'd gotten rid of it. But at one year follow-up, then they both are down at zero. Uh, so that took a total of three sessions. In fact, they really both lost their phantom limb pain within the first session. We then did a case series with phantom limb pain with, with six more individuals. And this chart shows that we got large reduction in distress, greater, even greater reduction in pain itself, reductions in depression, and post-traumatic stress disorder symptoms on a scale that relates to how large a change, large changes are in this area, medium changes here. So we get huge changes in subjective disturbance and an elimination of pain. And what we learned is there was one place in the world, and it happened to be the University of Tübingen, where they could measure phantom limb pain in the brain, its existence in the first place and its disappearance. And they had shown this with arm amputees using the MEG, that's the magnetoencephalogram, uh, which measures the magnetic emanations from the brain. It's like a multi-million dollar improvement on the EEG as it's measuring the magnetic emanations, which give better localization. And what they had found is, say, with an arm amputee, that if, you, if the arm amputee was, who had the phantom limb pain, if their arm was, was anesthetized with a brachial block anesthesia, then the brain would normalize as measured by the MEG. And when the anesthesia wore off, the brain would reorganize in a way that showed the pain had returned. We thought, since we're getting success with EMDR and phantom limb pain, then we ought to be able to go there and use EMDR with these amputees and find the same results, only more long-lasting with EMDR. So my late wife and I went to the University of Tübingen, and this is the MEG itself. It looks like a giant hair dryer and uh, has to be in a room that's protected from the Earth's magnetic radiation in order to measure these minute emanations that come out and, and are able to show the presence or absence of phantom limb pain. Um, I think that 
well, let me, let's say that my right arm is amputated. Then on the contralateral side of my brain, those neurons have nothing to do. And they get recruited when the lip is stimulated. And the more the lip is stimulated and the person then, um, we, they can figure out where where it ought to be located on the contralateral side. And if it's located somewhere different, the degree of that angle, the greater the angle, the greater the phantom limb pain. So I'm going to back up for a minute and talk a little bit about what we actually do in an EMDR session. Let's take a fairly neutral case like uh, an automobile accident victim. I would ask the individual to get an image in their brain of the worst part of the accident. As they held the image in mind, I would ask them a few questions about the thoughts and the feelings that that image brings up. And then I would ask them to hold all of that in mind, the image and the thoughts and the feelings, and move their eyes rapidly back and forth for about 30 seconds. Now, just about everybody has difficulty doing that, so I help out by just having them track on the end of my pen for 30 seconds. At the end of the 30 seconds, I would ask them to let the image go and take a deep breath and look inward and see what was there in their brain at that point, whatever is there. I would ask them to hold that in mind, again, go through the eye movements, so we follow the, individual, tra the individual's train of associations wherever they go, using the eye movements each step of the way. Um, there is one other part to what we do, and that is because we're dealing with people who are traumatized, we want this to be safe as well as effective. And so the first thing we actually do is set up what's called a safe place. And a safe place is any place that they can think of where they feel safe, comfortable, a sense of, of, of ease or well-being. And then they're instructed that if any point in the rest of what we do, if they feel overwhelmed by their feelings, they give us a hand signal to stop, and then we stop and bring up the safe place. So it acts as an escape hatch if we need it. Now that's the entire procedure. And it's very simple, but as simple like chess is simple. The basic moves are simple, but as you go through it, it gets more complex because everybody's different, everybody has different chains of association. And the therapist's basic rules are, if the process is flowing, you stay out of the way. If it gets stuck in some way, then you intervene in some highly prescribed ways to help it get unstuck. So that is what happens in EMDR, and it leads to questions such as, why does a strange sounding procedure like that do anything? And we have some scientific evidence, and we have some educated guesses. Now the scientific evidence has to do with, first of all, 20 years of, of brain imaging where with brain imaging you can show initially that when the person thinks of their trauma, their brain lights up in a way that shows they're under intense distress. And after successful treatment, their brain now lights up in a way that shows this is a normal memory not associated with intense distress. So it documents the changes, but it doesn't say why those changes occurred. And actually in the last two to three years, we are now able to use brain imaging that not only shows the beginning of an EMDR session and the end, but actually does brain recordings all the way through. And so you get to see how the brain changes during the course of the, the treatment. And so this has been done. We worked with a group in Italy 
who followed our protocols, and they were able to, with PTSD, in a single session, show how the brain lights up with PTSD and how it changes so at the end of the session, PTSD is no longer there. Okay. We worked with a group in Japan, and they did a similar kind of brain imaging, only now with phantom limb pain, an individual has phantom limb pain. We see how the brain lights up at the beginning with the pain, and then we see how the brain changes during the course of the session to the end point where the person no longer has phantom limb pain. What this means, and this is really the headline, what this means is that EMDR is the only form of therapy that has a proven neurobiological effect on the brain, not only with PTSD, but also with phantom limb pain. And so from this, we really are pushing the frontiers of science. This kind of work needs to be replicated, needs to be studied further. And the, the things that my late wife and I and others in the EMDR field have been able to do in terms of pushing those frontiers, we feel very excited about, we feel very grateful for. And the last 25 years of my life working with EMDR and with my, my friend, my lover, my helpmate, my partner, have been really the most exciting 25 years of my life. And I feel thoroughly blessed and grateful to have been able to be a part of pushing the edges of, of science. So, thank you very much.